Welcome to another War Game Review from theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. And I'm Alexander. Tonight, uh, actually our families are gone. We're totally alone tonight. Yes, we're very sad. Very sad. Yeah. It's awesome. Sorry. Um, yeah, they're out doing some things and we had the entire evening. We, we both finished work around 5, came home, set this freaking game up, and we've been playing for how many hours? F five hours? Five, five hours? going on five six hours. hours. So the game we played tonight is At Any Cost, Mets 1870. The game is designed by Herman Lutman and published by GMT Games. In fact, this game just came out in February, yeah. right? Yeah, this is a quite hot off the press. This yeah. is a new one. So Herman was... Lutman, a great designer. Oh, a fantastic We've played designer. a few of his games. Love his games. Um, he does some he, a, a great spectrum of games that he does as well. Like He's done a lot of different war games out there. But he did, like, Dawn of the Zeds. Oh, we love Just, that like, game. A super fun, trashy games. Love to it. really deep historical games like this one. So kudos to him. This is an awesome kind of addition yeah. to that as well. Another game that I like of his is that uh, Attack of the 50-Foot Colossi. We talked about that in our solo video that we did the other day. Just an off-the-wall... I think the word is trashy, right? It's just a sci-fi... The theme yeah. that's just fun. It's yeah. just, and it's got a lot of neat mechanics. I would say about this game, this is a serious war game. A oh, very yes. This is a very serious and in-depth system. So so here's the rules of play. It's only 28 pages, but man, that's a dense 28 pages. And Don't you think? A, it's a it's a detailed 28 pages right. as well. There's a lot of things to consider in this game. Well, there are um, exceptions and little additions. Yeah. Now, the game is really, really well aided. Um, yes. Each player has two full double-sided play charts that are very, very good. There's all the terrain effects charts, all the modifiers. It's all right there. Two different uh, combat results tables, so different types of combats. All the modifiers and different charts and, and tables that you'll need to roll on. Um, but as, as many rules as there are in this game... Which is kind of a 50-50. Like you said, 20... How many pages of rules? Uh, what did I 20, say? 28? 28. I've played 50-page rule games before, um, so this is a, a shorter than those, but the game itself is playable. Yes. And is still fun. Yes. Like, it's serious in that it's just like, this is a proper war game, but it is still fun to play. I'm not sitting here like, this is a boring simulation. No. And no. I want to pull my hair out because I'm just trying to grok this thing. It's very fun... Some there's uh, there is some kind of wild random kind of parts to it, which are actually, to be honest, completely laugh out loud, so, and not in a goofy way, but a ha, 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 really that just happened. Yeah, and and it's craziness, you know, for, which is great for a game that covers that kind of the Franco-Prussian War. Yep. This is 1870, so you've got the beginnings of some mm -hmm. modern technology, um, but you've still got very very old. Um, traditional war N games. Napoleonic uh, yeah. warfare. The right? way they thought about things. Yeah. So you've got these divisions with battle lines and artillery and men and cavalry charges, but you've also <laughs> got effectively machine guns. Yeah. Uh, and you just mow people down. Uh, Very interesting. Things like that. And, and, and so a really cool game with a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. So, so the game is the, the activation system is a chit pull. So it's a blind chit pull. There's a lot of elements to that chit pull, though. There are elements that, you, you know, of your different formations, you have maybe three to five chits that are in there. Then you have a thing called the Fortunes of War, which is a chit that can affect both sides positively. It's kind of a random thing. You also each have a commander-in-chief uh, chit. Yeah, which kind of allows wild. You, yeah, it allows you to activate any formation. And then there are four or five... Event chits. Yes. And those are those are tailored per the scenario or per your planning phase yep. if you're planning the longer They tell you put in these five or these six. Or well, you can select from this pool. Right. So you you can make some decisions about what you put in there. And those give you things like an, a, an opportunity fire right. or a cool bonus in this type of attack. 
You got one that I think you kept forgetting. Yeah, I was... It gave you like two or three column yeah, shifts that you forgot. Shift if, you're, if you're attacking with infantry. Yeah, like, it had I to be just, infantry. Well, I just forget that I had it. Yeah. But there's... So the the chip pull system makes this a fantastic solitaire game as well. Yes. No hidden information to an extent. There's a little bit, which we'll get into in a second. But it's very easy. You just pull, do what it says. Pull, do what it says. Um, each, of the, each of the different colored divisions... Um, so it represents a division, and most of the divisions have probably like uh, anywhere from like five to ten pieces. Yep. And it's usually a mix of cavalry, artillery, um, and and line infantry units. And so you you go through kind of a you pull that chip. I activate that formation. Who's in command? Who's not in command? You go through that little rigmarole, and then you then the, the sequence of the activation is really cool. You go through yes. fire combat. So everyone shoots their weapons, then you do moves, and then you do assault combat. If you're adjacent. Yeah, so, so you can get into doing some really fun stuff. You blast your artillery, um, if you, you, know, you can get them in, line of sight, to soften them up, and you charge them with your men and do assault combats. Uh, you, you, know, do, you literally roll to see if you do like strong cavalry charges. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. The level of detail in here, without it... It's detailed. It was complex. Yeah, it took us a yeah. long time to learn and play, but it's not too much. I didn't feel overwhelmed no. by this. You just It took a couple of rounds for us to get comfortable with that. Speaking of the detail, I'll give you an example. The cavalry units, there are three different types. There's light cavalry, medium cavalry, and heavy cavalry. A lot of that detail involves the type of cavalry, and, and when they're charging, they get bonuses... Yeah. There's also a, a check to see if they can charge, even. So, so there's just a lot of those details in there. I consider those thematic details. Very much so. That really were included in this game, trying to create the feeling of the Franco-Prussian War. Yeah. Which is really, I, I think, very well done. A lot of times war games don't necessarily do that to a great level, or, or, or a great level of detail. Man, this this really did, and I like that. I really did. And it creates chaos. There yes. Because you don't know any kind of activation order. Well, you know, whatever you pull, that's what happens. So you could get hammered, and then you get back, or it could be, you know, almost a you go, I go if they come out that. That way. didn't happen very often, but it could be. Yeah, and then, but then a lot of things like to do a cavalry charge, you have to roll to even see if your guys yeah. can do it. So it's like, can they muster the yeah, you like the courage uh, to do it? No, they don't. Yeah. You can just do a regular normal move. So th there's a lot of elements of the chaos of the war. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, they, they said the three FOWs. It was, this game does fog of war, fortunes of war, yes. and frictions of war. Yeah. And, and, and those are all kind of put into this game. The fortunes of war comes through kind of the chit system. The fog of war you comes can't... from the status markers. Yes. Yeah. You're not supposed to look... You're supposed to put all your condition markers under your unit. Yeah. And and I can't necessarily say, hey, Alexander, tell me what that guy's condition is. You, you, you're not supposed to share that. Yeah. So you never know, can that guy really do a, a, a standard assault or can he really attack well? You're not supposed to know that. And I, I like that element of it. And you can try to memorize those. It, it's but impossible. Good luck. Yeah. I could do it the first round or two because there weren't as many pieces on there. And then all of a sudden we got a bunch of... Uh, guys, a whole slog of guys moved up and it became impossible. Yeah, and that's really cool. Great. Just, just some neat elements. And that's the only part that would be like hidden information for doing a solo. Right. But, I, but again, I don't know you, that couldn't, that would... you couldn't ever remember those. So no. to me, this would be an excellent solo game I think it as would. well. It's a long game for sure. Yes. We played just the kind of the short first game and we, we it just took, it took us a long time. Again... This is a brand new system. We've never played this system. Mm -hmm. I have never played a game in this era. So right. there was a lot of kind of changing my thinking. I play, we play a lot of World War II games yeah. or, you know, different kind of periods, but nothing like this. So I have to kind of think about, all right, how do I use my units effectively, the different mixtures that you've got, things like that. So it took us a while to learn, but I don't pin that down to this being an overly no. mega complex I, game. I think the complexity on the box is a 6. It's a 6 on every one of GMT's games, though. I feel like this one's probably a 7. I think it's in yeah. that higher, upper echelon. 
But still, I think it's approachable. If you play war games, you're going to get this. Yes. I think you're not going... You're going to struggle at first just because it's a little bit of a paradigm shift, like you yeah, talked about. I believe so. I, I, another element I wanted to cover is... he Herman did a great job of taking what the Prussians were good at and then including that in their, yeah. in, in their tables. So, for instance, Prussians had better artillery. They didn't have the, the machine guns... But they got a bonus on their fire attacks with artillery. Yeah. And the range was much better. I think my range was medium up until five. Up until four. Four. And they had, a, they had a longer range, yeah. Right. So two, three, four was, was effective range. Five, six, seven, eight, extended range. And, and so that was different than yours. Three yeah, range. very different. So it, it was something that I think was included. And typically the cannon counters had a better value on them. Yes, they did. And, and also your... Your leaders, the HQ units, yep. had, a, had, better, had a much better uh, aggressive. aggressive value. Yes. Whereas mine had a much better defensive, defensive value. And that, once again, mimics the fighting styles of the two countries. Yeah. I think that the German are, Germans are like badgers. They're, they're going at you. The French are more, hey, let's build the Maginot Line. Let's, <laughs> let's put in these really great defenses. And, and that really played out. I thought that was a, a, a good job of doing that. The other thing I liked... Um, in that same regard is I felt like the different infantry units felt a little different. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think what the... I mean, most of my infantry units were 6-4s or... And I felt like most of yours were 4-3s. Four yeah. Four and 5 th So I felt like my infantry were a little better and, and my artillery was a little and better. And your, your... It's not called a morale value. The, T, the right. TCR... Yours was typically higher than mine as well, so it was yes. much harder for me to to kind of break your guys, yeah, um, and to affect them from a morale standpoint. But if I could do wounds to them, yeah, wound is a wound, yeah. And, and that's the other thing. The I tell you, these combat tables are very difficult, yeah, and not difficult to understand or get. It's really hard to do damage. Yeah, you have in, to, in some instances, you really have to get to the right side of that table and be in the 14, 15, or 16 column. And then you get really good odds. Yeah, you get great people. But man, when you're down in these two threes and fours, it's like, it's oh, of, I roll, you roll two dice. One of the dice determines the value, and the other dice determines the kind of the save. It's kind of like the morale check. Yeah, yeah. which is really fascinating. I'm basically rolling the morale check for you. Yeah. And it was really hard to overcome those values. You'd roll a nine and then you'd roll a three. So yeah, I'm so like, it's like oh, you overcame it. Oh, I, I take a mor I have to make a morale check. Well, you the morale check that I just rolled was pitiful, so yeah. I easily make it. And that's weird doing that it is the, very weird. as the attacker. Yeah. I, I'm rolling that, you have to I, That would have been a great one. I hit you and then you have to overcome this value. A seven. And, and sometimes just, oh. and sometimes the table says Plus two or plus one or yeah. plus three. So that seven you rolled on a nine, let's just say you're here, it would have been a plus three, so it's a ten. You're never going to overcome that. Yeah. That yeah. guy's going to lose every time. So there's some really neat yeah. just nuances to that combat. And again, the the play charts are really good. They have all of the different modifiers, yeah. all of the column shifts, everything like that, that is uh, very understandable and clear. Yeah. I don't... Once we read the rule book... This was very obvious. Yeah, it, it became to the point where we we stopped referring to this at all, hardly. Yeah, and really just this followed. Rule, yeah, rule which is great for, for nuanced things that we did like once, like yeah, oh, like how the reinforcements set up off yeah. board and then walk on, yeah. or um, what happened when you didn't have an activation shit for yeah, a certain division. Yeah. Very interesting elements. But that's that's. What makes this game so cool is I felt like, for me, there was a lot of, maybe not entirely brand new things, but a lot of new nuances to things that yeah. I was familiar with. Yeah. I've played chip pull, I've played things with you know different unit types and all the modifiers, but how it pulls together gives you a, a very different style of combat. There's no zones of control, so yeah. you could get in there and do your cavalry charges. You've got formations kind of like walking past each other and like, ah. Oh, this isn't a very yeah. sticky game. You no, get in and out of things. And there were cool. a couple of times where I would force you to retreat, and you kind of walked through what would would be my <laughs> zones of control. But Every yeah, other yeah. war game we we play, it'd be like, oh, you took a reduction. And nope, not in this game. So it, 
I, I like that element. The other thing I thought was really cool was the low ammo and the, yeah. what was the worst one called? The rationed ammo. Rationed ammo. So when you roll doubles on your attack die, yeah. if you ever roll doubles, you're going to get a low ammo chip. It's going to cause two column shifts to the left on your attacks, yeah. which is devastating. If you ever get the rationed ammo, you have four column shifts to the left. Yeah, and it becomes be crippling. You kind of ask yourself, why am I even attacking? You know. <laughs> so then you've got to get them back to HQ yes. so they can start so they can rally some and rally get, get some and... ammo. So I like that element too. There's just a lot of really cool, I, I, like I said, I'll go back to thematic war elements from this period of, of war. It very feels very much like a Civil War game. And we haven't played a lot of Civil no, War games. No, I don't games. know if I've played any. Um, but this felt like a Civil War game with some of those elements. I re really liked this. So what we'll do, let's, we'll take a quick look at the board and we'll show you at least some of the mechanics. There's a lot. We'll show you some of the stuff that makes this kind of game a bit unique so you can kind of see it. And then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So uh, here's a quick look at the, at the well, this is a very small portion of the map. Um, if you want to see kind of more of all the components, uh, Grant did an unboxing that you can kind of go take a look at. Uh, but this is kind of typical of what your battle lines might look like halfway through a game. Yeah, I'm just kind of set these up here. Um, so it, it, as you can see, uh, the blue units here, the French, and you've got the oops, gray Prussian units down here. And within those units, those, these subsets, there's these kind of colored bars at the top of each one. So you have these green ones here. This is a 10th Prussian division. You have the third French division up here. It might be core. I think it's the third core is what it is. I'm not sure exactly. And then you got a green. You got the, so there's the, there is a dark green. This is also a light green. This is actually a slightly different color. So the, and the, those are the res, the reserves, cavalry unit there. Um, but it's a chip pull activation system. So you'll have a cup here, and inside a bunch of chits. And just like you'd expect, you kind of randomize them, pull one out. What are we doing? Oh. This is a special event. This is beaten zone. I don't know if you can see that. Well, I guess not. That's unfortunate. That's having a hard time focusing there, isn't it? Now, basically, that is a special event that the French play against. Um, that enables them to do uh, a bit of opportunity fire. But normally you pull out something like this, which is a little command token. That means this, the green French fourth core here, all these dark green units, these are going to activate. So you look at which one's the commander, which is this one right here, the HQ. You choose a stance. That's a really neat part here. So you choose, do I go A aggressive, which gives me a three command radius, or do I go D defensive, which gives me a four command radius. And you might say to yourself, why would I never go not defensive? I would always do that. I get better command rating and a better command radius. Well, here's why not. Because on this particular table over here, if you look at the postures, if you're aggressive, you can move, fire combat, you can engage, which means go adjacent to enemy units, assault combat, cavalry charge, Use road march, rally, and build earthquake. You may not do these things here. You can't rally your units when you're aggressive. If you go defensive, you cannot engage, your cavalry cannot charge, you cannot do assault combat, except adjacent cavalry. You can always do that. But there are limitations to those. So you're like, oh, I got all these command points, but you can't go in and go and kill the enemy. You can do fire combat, you can shoot from a distance, but that is typically less effective. So you've got some cool decisions to be made there. And then once you do that, you say, okay, who's in, who's in command range? And command range is counted uh, just by, by basically by hexes. Most things are, are kind of a one command range. Uh, forest hexes cost two command range. So if I had someone in here, you'd go one, two, three, four, five. You'd look at someone who was out of command at that point especially the further along they went, just because the runners had a hard time or a slower time getting through the forest to relay orders. Um, anyone who's out of command, so for example, if these guys are all the way down here, 
that out of the command range, what happens is, is there's 13 of these out of command tokens. So get these over here, you can see them. And these out of command tokens, so there's, again, there's 13 of them, they all have an effect on the back that is random. You don't know what it is. This one says cautious. And some of them say, well, it's cautious, it's all boring. This one says frozen. And this one says withdraw. There's a lot of these different things. And what you do is you kind of deal them to all of your out of command stacks and you just put it down. You've no idea what it is. You pick them at random. This one, these guys are out of command. Oh, they were back at town. Sure. And what happens is, is they don't act. They don't do anything on their turn. You use all your other normal guys. You do your fire combats. And that's what you do. You do fire, move, assault combats. Um, so let's say, ooh, um, can anyone actually fire here? So this guy over here, now he doesn't have the range or anything like that. Oh, this is so boring. All right, let's pick just randomly. Um, let's see. Ooh. So we've got some cannons. Let's just put these up here. So we have cannons and artillery. So your cannon has like a, he has a three value here. He's gonna kind of shoot at this dude in the town. And so what you do is you consult your fire combat results table. So we had a cannon and he's shooting, it's a French cannon. So you look at the little range, he's at range two. So that's an effective range, that's good news. If you are firing at extended range from long distance, you would be half strength. If you are firing at canister range, which is adjacent, um, you shoot at one, 150 times your strength value, or a minimum of plus one. So I'm a three, I'm a shooting here. Let's see, and you just go down this list of column shifts. I am none of these things, I am none of these things. Oh, shooting into a town. What, three negative column shifts? Great, so I was a three, and I'm going all the way down here. Not great. And so you end up rolling on the worst table possible at this point. So you end up, you know, that's not a good thing to do. You know, it's free, it doesn't hurt you. So what you do is you roll the dice, you roll 2d10. This is my firing dice, this is my morale dice. You roll them, oh, great. We rolled a five and a one. Consult the table, the C table, no effect. So any, no effect, I have missed. If I'd have rolled a nine, we would have had to do a morale test. And so what that is, is that this guy compares his value to eight, and he subtracts that from the one. So this is the morale value that I already rolled. He doesn't make a morale save, he just compares the value to him. So he's got an eight there, and what you do is you look, let's see, eight minus one is negative eight, so if it's less than or equal to negative one, no effect. So you wanna roll high on this dice. Oh, I rolled a nine, yay, I hit. But you also wanna roll high on this dice as well. So really, ideally, I'd like to roll that sweet, sweet 10. Because that way, 10 minus 8 is 2. And a 0 to a 3 is one morale hit here. So they would take a morale hit, which means they get this shaken marker. And like we said earlier, the shaken marker you put underneath him. So he knows he's shaken. He's got a negative 1 strength point and a negative 1 TCR. And the TCR is that 8 value in the red box. Although I might forget that. I can't ever look at this ever again. So... You know, hopefully I try to remember that the best I can. So he's shaken. Great. That's good news. Now, like Grant says, if I rolled a 9 and a 9 on this, that's great news. You know, I hit, and I also get him to be shaken, but because I rolled doubles, my cannon takes this low ammunition marker. And the low ammunition marker, as you can see, is a negative two column shifts whenever they do fire combat. So that's very bad. Again, this is a status marker, so I put it underneath my cannon. So he has to remember that, that that's the case. So I just put it underneath and stack him. Now, I've played a lot of war games with a lot of administrative counters, and if you've watched all of my videos, 
I, I don't typically like them because they can get quite egregious, especially in games with large stacks. Now, I did not feel that way in this game, and I was very surprised by that because there's a lot, there is a lot of counters in the game, and the game can be quite big, and you're going into a lot of melee or assault combat, you're very close together. I'm usually a tweezers kind of person because I'm very ham-fisted at times. This game I did not feel that way because the stacking limits are quite rigorous. At most, you would really end up with like three or four counters. If each one of those had an administrative counter, it would be very, very unlikely that that would be the case. So you'd have a stack of eight counters. You could do it, but it's very, very, very unlikely. Most, I think the highest stacks we had were like four, because you start splitting things up, doing retreats, moving away, uh, you just don't get the huge stacks of everything muddled and messed around. I didn't feel like the counter density was actually too bad in this game, which I was surprised by, pleasantly surprised. So what you do is you do all of your fire combats with all of your activated units, and then you do all your moves. And your movement value is the second white value, so this guy's got a 5, he's got a 3, he's got a 7, he's cavalry over there so he can move much further. You do all your moves. If you ever move adjacent, then they get defensive fire, they will literally do a fire combat on you. So if you're going to charge enemy lines, you've got to be ready to go all in and attack. You, you don't want to be just piddling around by them. I made that mistake a few times. Um, and then, once all the defensive fire has been resolved, you do assault combat. So then he would do an assault combat, if possible, where it, you, it's much, much bloodier. Um, the, res, the, C, the CRT for that is like, attacker takes three, defender takes one. There's, you know, there's no, no results. It's bad stuff will always happen to someone. Sometimes it'll happen to both of you. And that's, that you get into some really cool situations there as well. Um, so the, the CRT was very fun for doing assault combat because it was always wild. You were never guaranteed any kind of good results. There was always an option where, and sometimes very unlikely, but there was always an option for things to go badly for you. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the, that, that activation stuff. Um, if you want to do a charge with this cavalry unit, before you do that, you have to roll a d10 and get equal to or less than this number six, the red six, the TCR. So, oh, I want to charge, Oop, roll the die, I roll a nine, that's higher than the TCR, can't charge, just gotta move normally. So you get this kind of older, antiquated, didn't have radios, hard to organize battle lines and communicate as well, orders weren't relayed accurately at times. So that was really, really neat and fun to have in a game. Um, once you've done all of your activations of your in-command units, and that can take a while doing all the different combats, then, and only then, do you activate your out-of-command units. You just flip these over, so this one says maneuver. And then you just kind of consult the little chart here. Oh, I lost the chart, here it is. Maneuver, normal movement only. No engage. So I can actually move my unit entirely normally. So I might move them, they've got their full movement value. This artillery's got a five, one, two, three, four, five. He's got a six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Kind of run away. This guy up here flips his, and he had frozen. And frozen, as you may well imagine, is no activities allowed. Now, those are quite boring ones, in the sense that I think, you know, oh, I don't do anything or I run away. What you get is some of the fun stuff. And this happened to Grant. He pulled in advance, and if there's an enemy within four hexes, uh, then infantry must fire, move towards, and assault the nearest enemy. Cavalry must charge, or move towards and assault the nearest enemy. Artillery must fire at nearest enemy. So, Grant had this unit here, and they were out of command, and they he pulled advance, and he had to come and charge me, and it was hilarious. Uh, just because it was so wild and unexpected, you know, they were out of command, hadn't received orders for two hours in, you know, in the game, you know, a couple of turns had gone by, and, and thematically they're like, well, there's an enemy position there, we haven't seen anything else, and let's go, let's go get him. And they did, and they charged, 
and it was I counter charged and I had some defensive fired and it went horribly but it was very very fun and that's what I really enjoy about this game the the charts and tables make what is quite a complex game approachable and the detail in the game is accessible you know, it takes a while to go through everything, and there's some bits and pieces you want to keep reminding yourself of. But this is not a scary game by any means. It was very, very fun. Um, the counters themselves go decently. Um, the turns go quickly. And I had a really good time playing this. So let's take a quick look and, um, and get some final thoughts here. So uh, that was a look at the map. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the map, that map is beautiful. Oh, yeah. Terry Leeds and Mark Simonich yeah, this is did this map. It it belongs in a frame, frankly, hanging on a wall. Very well done. Very great, a great color scheme. Very well drawn. Love the little trees and the forest. So that it's it's really a very well produced and beautiful game. Yeah. So Alexander, tell me uh, tell me what your final thoughts are on this game. Uh, I had a blast playing this because it was something I felt it was new to me. Both from the theme to the execution, it was familiar, but also a lot of... I felt like I had to approach this game very differently from a lot of other games that I've played. From, from my literal like tactics of like how I'm going to deploy my forces, and I might have to be quite slow and plodding to kind of get them in a, in a good formation to then make an advance... And you had to, but you had you had to do things like fire your cannons to soften them up, because you yeah. walk up and do your assaults. Everyone gets a defensive fire before you can, and it do can be your assaults. Devastating. And you just you walk up on lines of cannons, and they do all their canister and grape shot, and you just like it's, it's absolutely it killer at times. Yeah. So it was really cool in that way. Uh, I thought that was neat. Um, again, it, the chip pull, I love it. This is a great solitaire game. Mm -hmm. So I had fun playing this, and and I want to play it more. Yeah. There's a lot of scenarios in this game. I think there's six? Yeah, I think there were six. Three, six or seven. And, and, and the other cool thing is they give you these scenario cards. Yeah, those are always neat. Yeah, just really easy to set up and follow. I like that as well. And you can make the game as small or as big as you want. You can yeah. play a small kind of game or you can play the whole massive board which would take you a really long time. I would say this is quite a long game. Well it's advertised as one hour per turn. And I think the bigger this game gets the longer you're going to oh, yeah. leave yourself. Yeah. If, you, if you got familiar with it you could probably cut that down but this is yeah. a big one. It's a big one. What was one thing you maybe didn't like or didn't understand well or didn't feel um the length was a lot mm -hmm. it was a lot if i if we played the whole massive game oh it'd, it'd you'd have to this is three or four weeks yeah the, of the, playing the a couple times a week um but i don't know if i didn't like anything yeah i just want to play it more to get more familiar with it i think right that's right. that's really what it is i almost i don't know that's not a bad thing that's no more of it well I, I think what i didn't like was just the 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 thought process shift I wanted to get in here and play it and understand it, and it took us a while to get it. That's not a bad thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think you're not going to jump into this game and immediately understand, oh, yeah, this is how the CRT works, and I know what I have to do. It took us yeah, like, a couple of rounds you to kind understand of be like, that. Oh, let me do an assault, and you're like, oh, that's a Yeah, I don't want to do that. Why would I do that? Assault. Yeah. Because you just there's a yeah. lot of things to remember. Once you get it down, fine, but yeah, yeah it's quite, it's a little So I felt like after we played for a couple of rounds, we started to get it. Both, we, it became more fluid, it became more memory driven, we were, we, we were able to respond and do what we needed to do. I, I think this game is fantastic. I think it models a lot of the chaos inherent in this, this yeah. conflict. And once again, I don't know that I know a lot about the Franco-Prussian War. I just know it's... I know almost nothing. You know, Napoleonic, and I know it's also very close to the American Civil War. And a lot of the same things happened in that battle as well. So, very well done game. Great production. Yeah. Fun to play. Most importantly, fun to play. I, I think after playing this, I would love to set it up, now that we understand it, yeah. and get after it so that we could... You know, experience it more. Yeah, experience the whole thing. Yeah. Because I'm sure if, if you had the whole kind of board... Oh, my gosh. Uh, that would, that would be, you'd have long turns, yep. for sure. There's a lot of activations with that. But, boy, you could have some real fun and see kind of some overall strategy as 
Yeah. Oh, flights collapsing, swing yeah, around, move around. Yeah, fun stuff there. So that was a look at, at any cost, Mets 1870 from GMT Games. Uh, look for a review on our blog over the next uh, three, four weeks. We're also going to put together some action points. Lots of really funny situations that we had tonight that just were very awesome because of the way the system is set up. So we want to share those with you. But yeah, th this is a great game. I think we both would give it a thumbs up. Yeah. And both we would both recommend this to a serious war gamer who is is okay trying to learn and feel comfortable with the system. Yeah, set this up on your table. It's going to be there for a yeah. few weeks. You'll have a blast. Play it out and, and have a good time. So thanks for watching. Uh, please visit our blog at theplayersaid.com. I've been Grant. And I've been Alexander. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to leave. If you're going to write the review, I'm going to leave this here. I think I've got enough where I can do my...